My humble pranams at the lotus feet of our beloved Sai, respected elders, brothers and sisters and children, J. Sai Ram. When I thought about what a moment with Sai means to me, I realised that there have been many beautiful moments with Swami and I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be able to reminisce on such fun moments and to share a couple that have had a big impact on me. The first time I went to Prashanti Nilayam was with my family in 1998 and where the Bavi class children from the UK offered a dance programme called Sai Mahima 3. At that time, Swami had told Karana Sanji, who led the group, and I'm sure many of you know, to bring another dance programme in two years' time. So in 2000, I also took part in Sai Mahima 4. Both plays were performed in the Purnachandra Auditorium in Swami's Divine Presence. I don't think I'll ever forget how intense the practices were. And, you know, we gave 100% commitment to them. Practices would be starting off once a week to every other day to every day traveling to Merton Science Center. And they would finish around mid midnight, if not later. Our dance teacher also was very strict and expected nothing less than 100%. Our sadhana was intensive and Karana Santi was very strict about this as well as discipline. You know, looking back on it now, I realised that I learned a lot from Auntie about the power and importance of Nama Smarana. I remember she would say, if we wanted to have this opportunity to perform the dance programme in front of Swami, of course, if Swami allowed it, but then how can he not if we prayed with absolute love and faith, Swami has no choice but to respond positively. Our sadhana and practices would continue when we arrived in Prashanti and those days I remember, especially as children, we struggled a bit, not only because of the summer heat, but in Swami's presence, there were always huge crowds of people, as you know. And that meant that we had to wake up earlier and line for darshan. So we were always sleeping on someone's back. But, you know, Swami rewarded us when he would surprise us and visit us during practices. At the end of both dramas Swami would distribute clothes to the children and pose for pictures with us and shout his blessings. Swami would also give very detailed feedback to Professor Anukuma who then meet with the group to share Swami's thoughts. He really melted our hearts when we heard Swami was happy with us. Of course you know it was great to hear Swami was happy with the play but I remember uncle telling us that it was due to our prayers, our discipline, how we conducted ourselves and behaved. This is why Swami was very happy with us. When there is sincerity and unity of thought, word and deed, Swami has no choice but to give, give, give. And he sure did. In both Sai Mahima 3 and 4, he gave group interviews, Pada Namaskar and so much more. At the end of Sai Mahima 4, Swami had told Auntie to bring another dance program, but this time in four years' time, and instructed Auntie that it wouldn't be appropriate for girls aged 15 or over to dance. So in 2004, I did join Sai Mahima 5, but I joined the youth group who were preparing bhajans. I remember at that time when I auditioned for the bhajans feeling very nervous and intimidated because everyone sounded amazing, but... Through Swami's grace, I was able to join the bhajan group. Swami says that devotional singing originates in the heart and those who sing bhajans get what's called a double promotion for they derive and distribute joy. I was really worried at that time how I would get that feeling for Swami in my heart and if I wanted to have the opportunity to sing in front of Swami, I had to really figure this out. The bhajan that I was practicing and that I sang in front of Swami was Madhava Mura Hara Murali Gopala. And for the next six months or so, I was completely and utterly obsessed practicing this bhajan. I remember in my bedroom I had a Swami's picture and I would take the picture from the wall and place it in front of me uh, when I was practicing harmonium. And I would practice this bhajan every single day for hours and hours trying to figure out, you know, what this bhajan meant to me. And 
you know, I didn't allow for any distractions and I was strict with my sadhana in the UK and in Pardi. But such is life, things don't always go your way. I remember when we were on the bus to Pardi, the AC must have messed with my voice and in the next couple of days I developed a flu and I was very unwell. I couldn't believe that this was happening, that, you know, even if we had the opportunity to sing, I may not be able to because of this flu. However, none of that really mattered because it was our last day and Swami still hadn't called us for an interview. The night before, I remember that Karna Santi told us that, you know, we really had to intensify our prayers if we wanted Swami to speak to us. So the next morning, you know, we were all eagerly waiting for Swami and was Swami testing us. He didn't arrive at the time he usually did. And my body was aching and my throat was dry and I had snot coming out of my nose and I really desperately wanted to drink some water but I was worried Swami would enter the hall. So I just stuck it out. But after two hours, I was like, right, I'm just going to get up and get some water. But, you know, Swami likes to play games. And as soon as I stood up, the lovely darshan music started, which meant Swami was coming. So I had to sit back down immediately. As we were sitting next to the entrance of the gates, as soon as Swami entered, he went straight to Karna Santi and uh, called the group for an interview in the Bhajan Hall. At this moment, I remember having a roller coaster of emotions. My heart was pumping really fast. And I was just thinking, oh God, I'm going to sound really awful in front of Swami. And everyone in Kuwan Hall is going to hear it too. So with these thoughts, I'm walking towards Bhajan Hall. But as soon as I entered, I remember feeling, oh, wow, this is really magical. And, you know, there is something so special being in the Bhajan Hall in Swami's presence. I think it's because it just feels very intimate because he's so close to you. Um, so after a while, Swami was speaking to various people. He asked Auntie, you know, start Bhajan's. I literally couldn't believe what was happening. All the preparation that we did with practicing with musicians just went out the window. We were going to sing a cappella and I realized what Swami meant by love his uncertainty. Swami saved me and probably everyone else having to hear me sing on, on the mic. So two bhajans go by and it was my turn. As soon as I started to sing, Swami turned his head to look directly at me. And he continued to look at me with a strong gaze. And I thought, you know, Swami's so playing a game with me. Who's going to blink first? Uh, because he continued to look at me uh, until I finished the, my whole bhajan. Just like how I practiced in my room for months, for hours, every single day. You know, the Vedas describe God as Kalati Dayanamaha. The one who transcends time, the timeless being. You know, truly in the presence of Swami, Time stood still, and what in reality is just a few moments seemed like an eternity. I can't really describe in words how I felt at that time, but Swami says he responds to you in accordance with your feelings, and he sure did. You know, Swami has brought all of us into his fold when it's the right time, when our hearts are open to receiving his love instantly. Swami knows the perfect time to deliver himself to us and when we will benefit it the most. He doesn't bless at the last minute. He blesses so at the right time. I would like to share one more moment that demonstrates this. In November 2015, I was due to go to Prashanti with my mother to give Swami my wedding invite to, for him to bless. At that time... I used to take my engagement ring off before I went to bed. A few days before my flight to Prashanti, one night I went to bed and before going to sleep, I just wanted to make sure uh, my ring was in the same place that I normally keep it. When I got out of bed to check, uh, the ring wasn't there. So I just thought, let me start looking uh, around my room to other places where I potentially could have kept it. I slowly started to panic and feel a bit sick to my stomach when 
I still couldn't find it. I was just lost thinking, like, where else could I have kept it? I was going crazy. I didn't sleep and I was searching for my ring the whole night in all sorts of places, even the hoover and the bin. And I remember the next morning I had a job interview that I knew I didn't do well in because I didn't focus and I just cried to my parents and they were really upset for me. Um, the night before our flight, it was Swami's birthday and I remember I was singing a bhajan in a minor key which completely fitted my sad mood. I was also sad that my husband worked really hard to pay for this ring and I was also a bit scared to tell him but luckily he was kind and told me not to worry about it and to enjoy my time in India and joked that he would find a ring uh, on Black Friday. On our flight to India, I felt really bad for my mother uh, because I was just in a depressed mood. When we arrived in Parthi, we went for morning darshan and I cried to Swami and told him how I felt. You know, I had time to reflect and realise that one of the best and easiest ways to free myself from my mind's tight grip on this attachment to the ring was to ask Swami to help me overcome my feelings on it so that I will be able to love his uncertainty. I remember saying to Swami, I surrender and trust you to give me only what you know that I need and accept whatever that may be. And honestly, I just wanted Swami to bless our marriage and that was more important to me. With that feeling, I took my wedding invite uh, to the Samadhi for Swami to bless. And we went back to the room. My mum went to get some lunch and I just told her I would stay in the room. I remember I had to, I needed to get something from my handbag. And as soon as I opened the zip to my bag, you wouldn't believe what I saw and I couldn't believe it. It was my ring neatly placed on top of other things and I just couldn't believe it. It was, it felt very so surreal that Swami had blessed my ring and gave it back with a free polish because the ring was blinging so brightly. And you know, you, you can bet that I placed my ring back on my finger and I have never taken it off again. But there was a Swami picture in the room and I cried like a baby again and just so grateful and thanking Swami. Um, you know, it felt like a full circle when me and my husband uh, went Prashanti for Shivratri for the first time together this year. And I know that Swami showered his blessings on us there. And I was reminded that he will never leave us and will share our joys and give us strength through challenging times. And with that, I'd like to say, may Swami bless your lives with beautiful moments, filled with love and happiness, and may He protect you always. Jai Sai Ram. <laughs>